if you're not aware, we're in a rather particular crisis in the church, right? I think this is akin to the 16th century, personally. Um, this is a massive moment in the church. And uh, among the many, um, we don't need to belabor the downsides, the, the upside of this, if you will, of what we're going through, is it's reminding us that the church really only has one thing to offer anybody. And the one thing to offer is Jesus. It's to point to him and what he's done. And increasingly so in the world in which we're living and in this culture in which we're living and in which your kids are growing up, a, a culture which is um, more and more riddled with despair, if they don't know how to see the world, they will fall prey to the despair. You know this. Uh, some of you have kids who's, who have classmates and friends who've taken their lives. Uh, the suicide epidemic in our country right now among young people is just that. It is an epidemic. The despair amongst our young people is off the chart. It's frightening. And it's because there is no hope in the world apart from God. It shouldn't surprise us. And you, as we've said in every single one of these Friday nights that we've done, our hands down, there's not a close second, the single most important pastor your son or daughter will ever have in their life. Whether they, uh, whether they, th they make you think that or not, it really doesn't matter. No one's close. You set a spiritual glass ceiling, especially dads, for children with regards to faith, and even more so for dads with their sons. So what I want to try to do tonight is uh, I'm, I'm hoping that as we go through this, for those of us for whom it's somewhat familiar or very familiar, you'll hear it again. Father Michael and I were just talking about this. I mean, you have to hear something seven times before you actually get it. We know that for those of us in sales. And we're in sales. Um, we just have the best product. Um, for those of us for whom it's new, I mean, I can't encourage you enough to take notes. Um, because the goal of this isn't to simply memorize something or to hear something. It's to learn how to reflect on the truths of the gospel, to pray on them, and then to interiorize them so that you can teach them to your kids so that you can then help them see reality as it is. Okay? So that's what I'm hoping for tonight. So I'll get to that line in a second. This is how I always begin this. So by the way, I'm going to do a, we're going to do a pilgrimage to Normandy, September 2020. Love to have you. File it away. Because Normandy is, I think, the best place to begin for understanding the Incarnation. So imagine we're in a high school class, and I'm showing you these pictures. So it's June 6, 1944, right? And I ask you this question, and it's a multiple choice quiz. Option A, the coffee in France is second to none. Who's voting for that? Like nobody, right? It might be true, but that's not why they're there, right? Option B, they're dying to see the Mona Lisa. Option C, the beaches in that area, off the chart. Like, no one's circling any of these, right? Option D, uh, I think they're there to fight. Yeah, of course, right? So they're there to, to go to war. Here's the problem. I show you, your kids, brother priests, that painting, and I ask the same question, and I get almost as many answers as there are people in the room. But the answer should come just as quickly, and it should be the same answer. He's there to fight. So my experience again and again is we don't know the answer to this question, which means when our kids ask us to help them understand the gospel, 
we don't know where to start, so what I'm offering you is a way to start. And when we get asked questions about the faith by our peers, whether it's at work or in our neighborhoods or in you know, our kids' sports teams, whatever, we don't really know what to do, so we just don't say anything. So I want to try to help us learn how to say what it is we should say to that. This is, again, especially critical, I think, for parents more than anybody else, more than for priests. I share this with priests all the time. I did this as a retreat for uh, the clergy in a diocese I won't name. So I was out there for like five days. Day three, this guy comes up to me. He's been ordained about the same amount of time as I have, so 25 years or so. And he says, did you come up with this? And I said, come up with what? He goes, with this kerygma thing. I said, no. He goes, you didn't? He said, no. I've never heard this. I got an email today from, or a text from a, a woman in our parish who's from another diocese. She moved here, and she, somehow uh, she had shared, maybe it was uh, some version of this talk with a friend of hers who's a priest down in this diocese, and he said something similar. He just says, you know, like, I love the Lord greatly. I, th I think of myself as an evangelist. I think I'm, I'm living a good life as a priest. I'm asking myself, why did I never hear this in seminary? So most priests don't know this. They, they haven't heard this, which means we don't hear it when we come to Mass, which means when our kids ask us basic questions about the gospel, we often don't know where to start. Okay, does that make sense? So that's why we're here. We're going we're gonna to try to start. So here's the, uh, here's the goals tonight. I want to proclaim the gospel to you. So come back here. Don't do that. So I want to proclaim the gospel. I want to try to give you new ways to teach and to preach and to share the gospel, because all of you are called to preach and teach and share the gospel. And maybe for those of us right now who just find ourselves discouraged because of what's going on in the church or in the world, I want to give us, I want us above all to leave here with what I would call unshakable confidence. Uh, God is not nervous right now. He's not looking down from heaven going, oh my gosh, what happened? He's just not anxious. So if he's not anxious, I don't need to be anxious. I don't need to be anxious about my transition. I don't need to be anxious about money. I don't need to be anxious about my health. You don't need to be anxious about your children. Because that's the devil's temptation to you is, man, your, your kids are living in the worst possible time in human history. And you should be terrified. No, you shouldn't. You should be unshakably confident in God. Because he has them and you and me in his hands and he doesn't have any rivals. So, the best place I know how to start is right here with uh, St. Paul. So, Paul says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He's not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So, we hear gospel, especially as Catholics, and we tend to think of the gospels. But the gospel, small g, is before the gospels, right? The gospel is the proclamation of what it is that God has done for us. So Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. So when he says power there, the word that he's using in Greek is this word, dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. In other words, the gospel itself is explosive. This is particularly encouraging for priests and for parents and for teachers. Because what it means is it really doesn't matter whether or not you or me are good communicators. The gospel is power. Not the messenger of the gospel is power. The content itself is explosive. It's not ordinary news. It's extraordinary news. And all it takes is someone to deliver it. You don't have to be the most gifted orator. You just have to deliver it. Father Michael can testify to this. It's amazing how many times people come up to us after Mass and say, Father, I just want to tell you, when you said, and then they'll say something like, you know, mm, 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 it just, just like ripped right through me. And, and I know everything I say. And I didn't say that. <laughs> like, it, it's almost like God just said, son, I just need you to move your lips. Don't worry. 
They're not going to hear what you're saying. I'm going to be speaking. We just have to deliver the content of the gospel and trust that God will do the rest. So don't worry about, I just feel ill-equipped. Moses stuttered. God did okay things with him, right? Don't worry about that. Just deliver it. So the gospel's power. So I equate it, going back to Normandy, to you and me living in France, and we wake up on June 7th, and I got a newspaper in my hands, and you're sitting there at the table with me. So Roland comes in, you know, I'm making a cup of coffee, and he says, hey, uh, what happened yesterday? I go, uh, allies landed. That wouldn't be how I would tell him that, right? We live in France, occupied country, got a tyrant ruling over us, family members been killed, countries destroyed, people sent off to slavery. This is not ordinary news. This is extraordinary news, right? The Allies landed. Someone came to fight for us and to liberate us. So that's, that's the gospel, only the gospel is infinitely more so than that. So as you share the faith with your children or with your peers, this is not data we're handing on. This is transformative news without which there is no hope and there's no meaning. Big deal you make a lot of money. My dad made a boatload of money. He's gone. It was utterly impotent to stop my mom from dying. Scripture says, do not put your trust in something as, get a load of this line, uncertain as wealth. That's like a dagger in the heart of an American. Where else is there certainty? <laughs> now, wealth is uncertain. It can go like that. 2008 was not that long ago, and some of us remember it well. It goes in a flash. It can't save me. This news saves. So, technically speaking, the gospel is called the kerygma, or the kerygma, we could say, is the, the essence of the gospel. Listen to how John Paul describes it. So he says, the, the kerygma is the initial ardent proclamation by which a person is one day overwhelmed and is brought to the decision to entrust himself to Jesus Christ by faith. Just think back for a second on whether you went to Catholic school or you went to religious ed. How many of you, in all honesty, were overwhelmed by the proclamation of the gospel? I would say if five hands were to go up right now, that would be four more than I would think. You might have gotten overwhelmed by your parents' testimony. Maybe. I did. But by the way the faith was taught to us, almost nobody's overwhelmed. It's just stuff they learn. It's like a, it's a, another subject. It's like math or English. The, the only problem is in most Catholic schools and in most Catholic religious education programs, every single subject gets tougher except for religion. Which, especially for a young boy growing up, is code for there's nothing here. You keep giving me the same lame answers every year. I want meat. So as, as, as you and I hear the gospel, reflect on the gospel, pray with the gospel, and the way that I'm going to try to break it open here, the goal is for us to be overwhelmed by it, to let God overwhelm us by it, and then to share it, most especially with those congregants that you have, your children, your parishioners, in a way that they're overwhelmed. And don't worry about whether or not they let on. Okay? So tragically, again, I just don't think this is how, I don't think it's how we preach, and I don't think it's how, how people hear it in other segments. I shared this right before I think I saw Anthony. 
I shared this with a, a young 24-year-old girl. She's not in our parish. She came to see me. Don't know why or how she got to me. We're sitting in a day chapel talking. She's beautiful, extremely successful, and her life was a mess. And so she wanted to try to walk through some things. And so I said, can I just, like, I do this all the time. Can I just tell you how I see reality? She goes, yeah. So I did this in about six minutes. I got done. She is bawling. And she looks at me and says, that's not the God I knew growing up. I said, well, this is the real God. So let's talk about him. So what's the kerygma? The kerygma is this. It's four parts. So the goodness of creation, sin and its consequences, God's response to our sin, and then our response to what God has done. I think it's personally helpful to further break these things down into four words. Created, captured, rescued, response. So I shared this uh, at a gathering of some folks out in Denver. A friend of mine was there who's just a great evangelist, and I asked for his critique afterwards, and he says, that was really great, Padre. He says, uh, here's the problem. It wasn't repeatable. And I went, that's very helpful feedback. Thank you. What would be repeatable? He goes, you've got to find some way to break this down for people. Th- this is how I break it down. Four words. So try it. Created. Created. Captured. Captured. Rescued. Rescued. Response. Response. Try it without me. That's the gospel. It's that easy. So we're going to walk through especially the second and the third part. I'm going to touch quickly on the first. The fourth part we spend the rest of our lives doing. Um, But it's the second and the third part that I don't think usually people get right. So for each each of these first three anyway, as we reflect on, because again, the point of this is to take it and to go pray with it. As we pray with each of these words or each of these four parts, there's a grace for each one. At least I think there is. So St. Ignatius, some of us went to Jesuit schools. Uh, Ignatius would always encourage people, when we go to pray, pray for a very specific grace. Like, ask God for things. So for me, for each of these three parts, I ask him for a grace to continue to try to grow in it more fully. So the grace of the first part, created, is wonder and trust. The grace of the second part, captured, odd as this sounds, is despair. We'll talk about how to do that. The grace of the third part, rescued, is unshakable confidence. So created, wonder, and trust. Captured, despair. Rescued, unshakable confidence. So let's look at part one. Wonder and trust. So this comes in a particular way from trying to understand more fully the first 11 chapters of Genesis and most especially the first three. So in a lot of different contexts, like when we did rerouting, for those of you who were here when we did that, you know, we spent a lot of time, all we did was Genesis 1, 2, and 3 because I'm convinced you get these three chapters right, you get everything right. If you get these three chapters wrong, you get everything wrong. So the challenge most people make when they read Genesis 1 to 11 is they read them literally. They're not to be read literally. They speak truth, but they're not literal. How do you know that? There's two stories of creation in consecutive chapters, and they're different. And who knows what's made on the fourth day? The sun on the fourth day. How do you get a day without a sun? You don't. Right? It's like God's telling you, hey, dum dumb, don't read this literally. <laughs> okay? Try to understand the truth that's being revealed without getting stuck in, oh, how can it be true and not be literal? I mean, those of us who are, you know, Ellis and A majors, um, we have no problem with this. Those of you who are engineers, your mind is exploding right now. <laughs> so just deal with it. There's things that are, math is not the formula by which you understand the universe. Love is. And love is poetic. Okay? So oftentimes it's, it's mistakenly thought that the stories in Genesis about creation are just like all the other stories in all the other ancient Near Eastern cultures. There's nothing 
like the stories in Genesis in the stories of the ancient Near Eastern cultures. In the ancient Near Eastern cultures, there's a boatload of gods. None of them are any good. They're all at war with each other. At a certain point, they make man, the male, to be a slave. Then they make the woman for one purpose, children. There's no, there's no meaning to life, which means no parts of life have meaning. And so life is just totally despairing. What do you do in a world like that? You maximize pleasure and you minimize pain. That's what I do. That's what I did. That's what some of us did in here, right? Into that world comes the revelation of Genesis. And God says, no, there's actually one God. And he's really good. And everything that he made, he made out of love. Not out of need. And he made it without any effort whatsoever. He just said, let there be light. And pfft, there was light. And the highlight of everything that he made is the human person who alone is made in his image and likeness. And the human person is made for freedom and for love and for friendship. Friendship with God, friendship with each other. The only way the person gets fulfilled is by being loved and loving in that order. It's the only way you ever find happiness. Other things can bring fleeting pleasure, diversion, distraction, whatever, but they can't satisfy me. One of the loneliest times I've ever had in my life was when I lived in Rome. I'm surrounded by unbelievable beauty. I lived there for four years. I'm surrounded by beauty coming out of your ears, right? I'm looking at history everywhere. I'm a huge history buff. I have nobody to share it with. Lonely as I'll get out. It's where I learned how to pray. So we're, we're made for friendship. We're made for more than just stuff. Huh? So I just want to zero in real quick on one line in this because we want the grace here is wonder and awe. So scripture, you know, sometimes we read scripture and we think, because we think God speaks in an English accent very stoically, but he doesn't. Um, God is sheer joy. We don't think of God that way. God loves to play. I mean, he made us, right? <laughs> God loves to play. And scripture oftentimes is very comical without us knowing it. I think this is one of those places where it is. So Genesis 1.16, God made the two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, that's the good. You haven't drunk that much. The lesser light to rule the night, that's the moon, right? And so I picture, you know, whoever's putting Genesis down on parchment and he, so he made the sun, he made the moon. Oh, he made the stars, too. <laughs> he made the stars, too? Are you kidding me? Like, that was a forgotten reality? Do you know how many stars there are? <laughs> Do you know how big the universe is? The universe is 46 billion light years across. That's 46 billion times 5.88 trillion miles across, at least it was this morning, because it's ever expanding. Our galaxy is one of 100 billion, roughly, galaxies in the universe, each of which has roughly 100 billion stars in them. Now my mind's exploding, right? Like, we're talking numbers. Who, who grasps these numbers, right? So I heard somebody describe this one time. He says, so let me try to give you an image, a visual of how big the universe is. This guy had a, a profession. I still don't think I get the title right. I think it was a high energy particle physicist. But those of you who are physicists know these things. So, so he's given a talk one time on the universe. He said, let me just try to help you grasp that number. So imagine a sandcastle where every single grain of sand is a star. If you made a sandcastle of the universe, how big would the sandcastle be? Five miles high. Five miles high. It's the tallest mountain on the earth. Five miles wide. Five miles long. Where every grain of sand is a star. Oh, yeah. He made the stars. Forgot to mention that. I should probably tell you that. 
No, so there's the sandcastle, huh? Another image. So here's our sun. So our sun's a small star in the scheme of things. You can put just, just a little bit under a million Earths inside the sun. I think it's like 960,000 or so. The largest star that we had found up until two years ago, we've since found a bigger star, is called the Big Dog. That's the Big Dog. All right? You know how many Earths you can fit inside the Big Dog? Seven quadrillion. Not helpful. So I say to Joe, Joe, I want you to count from one to a million, and I'm going to see him win. Twelve days. I asked Paul, Paul, I want you to count to one to a trillion, and I will see you in 31 years. Anthony's going to count from one to a billion. No, it's the other way around, right? Billion, trillion. I'm going to see you in 31,000 years. And I'm going to count from now to one quadrillion, and you will see me in 31 million years. You can fit seven quadrillion Earths inside the largest star. He made that too. Forgot to mention it. <laughs> what, what's the big deal about this? Why is that so important? Because the one who made this, who just said, he didn't even say, he just said, let there be light. He's the one who right now has your life in his hands. He's got your son in his hands. He's got your daughter in his hands. He's got your spouse in his hands. He's got this world in his hands. He's got the church in its hands. He has no rival. He's not anxious. Don't be anxious. Whatever it is that's on your mind, and whatever's on my mind, and I can tell you there's a lot on my mind. <laughs> I haven't slept in weeks. Uh, God can handle it. I just need to surrender it. Stop trying to control it. You don't have to control it. Just give it to him. All right? That's the wonder. So this is where, you know, as you're saying this quickly, with, might be with your kids, might be with peers, whatever. By the time you're done with this, it's, it begs an obvious question, right? The obvious question is, well, that sounds nice, but how come everything is so obviously messed up? And it's not usually put that nicely. I mean, the world has gone off the rail. What happened? If God's good and everything he made is good, and he made it without effort, and he's got everything in his hands, how come children die of cancer? How come my test results came back the way they did? How come I lost my job? How come I've prayed for things I didn't get them? How come I'm struggling with ongoing sin in my life that I can't... St I mean, how come everything is so screwed up? That's the captured word. So everything's screwed up because of an enemy. So my experience is we tend not to get this part right at all. If we even talk about sin anymore and its consequences, usually people will say, whether it's in religious ed, uh, Catholic school, from a pulpit, well, the consequences of sin is separation from God. And I don't know about you, but when I was... 8, 9, 10, 18, 28, if you would have told me the consequence of sin was separation from God, I went, and so? <laughs> Big deal. That's not that moving. Th that's true, <laughs> but that doesn't quite get to it. The consequence of sin is you are both separated from God and you are in the possession of another. Th this is what we would call the bad news. And if you don't get the bad news right, the good news is just news. If you understand the bad news, you understand why the good news is extraordinary news. The bad news is more horrific than anything you have had in your worst nightmare. Some of us have either read or seen J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Tolkien got better than anybody else the mystery of evil. Evil is beyond our comprehension, and it's in the world. 
how did it get there, if God's so good? So we want to try to unpack this. So we want to try to get clear on a couple of different things huh, about the enemy. We want to learn his identity, his reason for rebelling, his strategy, his goal for your life, and the consequences of the fall. Okay? So we'll do this really quick. So his identity, the reason for rebelling, his strategy, his goal for your life, and the consequences of the fall. So his identity. So who, who is this creature? This creature was an angel, right? So Lucifer was his name when God created him, and he's created by God. He's a creature. His rival is not Jesus. His rival is Michael. That's why we pray the prayer of St. Michael. Okay? Jesus is, uh, Satan is a creature. God can, has, and will again crush him like a toad. He was created good. His name means light bearer. He often hides himself as an angel of light. That's why he deceives us so easily. His reason for rebelling, we usually don't get this right. We usually think that Satan's sin is pride, which is true, but it's not the reason for his rebellion. Scripture says this is the biblical answer for the rebellion of the enemy. Wisdom chapter 2, verse 24. Through the envy of the devil, death entered into the world, and those who are in his possession experience it. What's envy? It's more than jealousy. What's envy? Yeah, so it's a certain sadness over the good fortune of another, right? Who's he envious of? Don't answer that. Just think to yourself. You, you, you have to get this right or you don't understand it. He's not envious of God. He's envious of you. He's envious of the human race. Why? Because God created the human race to be divinized one day and to share in his own abundant life, which for an angelic mind, at least his angelic mind, is unfathomable and beneath him. That you and I, who are these creatures trapped in bodies, angels don't have bodies, they're not trapped in them, they're just sheer intellects. That we, lowly as we are, in comparison to them, so he thought, would be elevated above them and actually share in God's own divine nature one time. At one time. That's the end for which every human person was made. That's why the church is such a champion of human dignity at all its stages, from the moment of conception until the end. Because every human person has been created to be divinized. So out of envy of us, he goes to war against God's favorite creature, which is us. He doesn't go to war against God. Satan knows he can't compete with God. Envy's like, you have that? I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you don't keep it because I hate what you have. That's his reason for rebellion. What's his strategy? His strategy is simple. His strategy is to try to deceive us into thinking that God is not good. That was at the heart of the first temptation. Tried to plant the seed in Adam and Eve's minds, and it worked that God's holding out on you. If he really loved you, he'd let you have that. He won't let you have that. He doesn't really love you. And every time something happens in our lives, a prayer that doesn't get answered for whatever reason, something that doesn't happen in our lives that we were looking for, disappointment of one kind or another, he is right there in my ear saying, and you still talk to this thing? You still think he's good? You think he's a father? Don't you get it? He's not good. He doesn't care. He's not loving. He's weak. He's not even there. That's his strategy. That's why Scripture talks so much about the enemy. Because Scripture is game film. It's trying to help us understand how the enemy acts so that we will be on guard. And, and not only that we would know, but especially as parents, we would help our children to know how the opponent works. Right? How many people in here coach? Yeah. Right? So as you get higher and higher in coaching and athletics, right? You use film. I want to show you what we're going to face this week. Why? Because we want to win. Right? They run this play. Oh, Satan has one play. 
It's like off tackle every play. And he gets like 10 yards every play. It's one play. God is not good. Just know that. And know it's a lie. What's his goal? Here's his goal. He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. His goal is to mock you for all eternity. You pathetic man. God offered you abundant life. And you chose this? Wait till you see what I have waiting for you. That's his goal. That's the end game. So the consequence of sin is what I think we especially miss. So the consequence of sin is, uh, the, the best way I've heard this explained is unknowingly, right? And some of you have heard me say this ad nauseum over the last year, but unknowingly, when Adam and Eve rebel, right, when they fall, it's, it's a rebellion more than it's a fall, when they turn their back on God, when they're disobedient to him, refusing to listen to him, refusing to trust him, what they do, although they didn't intend to do it, is they sold our race, because we're all in them, if you will, as we're like children of a crack addict, right? Through no fault of its own, the child's born with the addiction. That's how we are. So they sold our race into slavery against two powers that we can't compete against. Sin and death. Death's pretty obvious, right? We've all lost loved ones here. Anybody bed in the bedside of a loved one as they were dying? Yeah, talk about a feeling of impotence, right? I remember standing at my mom's bed in our house in September, watching her go, and I can't do anything. My sisters can't do anything. She's just going. Death is a power. The other power is sin. So we tend to think of sin, if we think of it at all, as things that we do or don't do, or things that we say or don't say. That's true. But before it's that, sin is a capital S. It's a power. It's a, it's a dominion. Paul talks about it this way. Um, Romans 6, he says, just hang on to this last line, that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. When he's saying that, he's writing that really with a capital S. So again, sin is this malicious, it's like a government. That's, the, that's how Paul describes it. And it's trying to continually exercise control over me. And apart from God, it has control over me. The, the easiest way to prove this, like, how many people have said something like this in their lives? I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Like, have you ever done something that you hate doing, that you don't want to do, that you know you shouldn't do, and yet you do? Like, all day long, right? You ever wonder why? This is why. Because sin's a power. It's trying to control me. Which is why it's not enough simply to repent from sin. Like, I need someone to rescue me from the power of sin on my own. I can't do it. The single most provocative way I know how to pray about this is this image and the reality behind this image. This is where, when I share this, especially with young women, they cry. Because in one way or another, they get this, perhaps in a way that men don't. So the grace here that you want to ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand or to have to help you to experience is despair. Now, to be clear on that, the reason for that is I want to ask God to help me understand that if he had not done something, I would have no hope at all. 
at all. So the consequence of sin is like being captured by a trafficker. This horrific scourge that plagues our world. More slaves today than there have been in the history of the world. So you, you pray with this. We talked about this for those of us in the parish back at the beginning of Lent. You know, pray with, imagine what it would be like to be, have, have been captured, chained, used, exploited, abused, with no way to get out. That's the bad news. That was us. That's the consequence of sin. Does that make sense? That's is why the message of the gospel is so urgent. Because there's no hope apart from this. That's why it's so crucial for us to share the gospel with our kids or peers or whatnot. Because whether they, whether they let on or not, sooner or later, this is how we all feel. I feel stuck. And I don't, I don't see a way out. And there is no way out apart from God. Which brings us to the third word. So the third word is what? Rescued, Rescued right? The grace here is unshakable confidence. So what did God do in response? So there's way too much to, to try to grasp <clears throat> here. So let's just zero in on the passion in a special way. So we've done this here many times over the last, you know, six months or so, maybe especially so again in Holy Week this past week. It's, this is especially important for those of you who have sons. Because most young boys, or most young men, and most men for that matter, tend to think of Jesus as soft. He's kind, and he is, blessed be God. And he's gentle, and he is, blessed be God. And he's merciful, and he is, blessed be God. He's all those things. But Jesus is absolutely, utterly unconquerable. He is the hands-down greatest athlete of all time. That's why it's painted on the wall down there, outside our gym. There is no one who remotely compares to him. So, why did they land? They landed to fight. Why did God become a man? He became a man to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he became a man. He didn't come to tell stories, although he told them. He didn't come to do miracles, although he did them. He didn't come to do anything else. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to set us free. So Jesus himself talks about this in lots of different places and lots of different ways. So John 12, now the judgment of this world, the ruler of this world is cast out. This is right before he enters into his passion. But the passage more than any other passage that I find worth reflecting on for this. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here's Luke's version of it. Jesus, is, Jesus has been accused of driving out demons by, by Satan. And so he tells this parable to the people who are accusing him of this. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. So let's make sure we understand this parable. Who's the strong man? Yeah, Satan. What's his palace? The world. Who are his goods? Us. See, whether you know it or not, before you got baptized, cute as you might have been, um, you were born into the kingdom of sin and under the tyranny and the dominion of Satan. And you had no hope. It's like your passport said, I belong to the kingdom of darkness. He's the ruler of this world. That's why baptism isn't a cute little thing that we do. It's transformation from one kingdom to another kingdom, from one rule to another rule, from a tyrant to a benevolent dictator, if we can call God that. But when someone stronger than he assails him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Who's the one stronger than him? 
Jesus is, right? So Jesus comes to bind Satan so that you and I can go free. The, the, the very first miracle that Jesus does is the driving out of a demon. It's not insignificant. So there's this demon who's possessing a man, and all Jesus says to this demon is silence. Come out of him. It's actually more literally, be muzzled or be gagged. This is God talking to the enemy. Be gagged. There's no wrestling match. There's no big, huge fight. There's just be gagged. And Satan's like, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's no competition here. So this is why he came. Second person of the Trinity is the invasion, the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity is the invasion of one kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, by another kingdom, the kingdom of light, which is stronger. But here's the key. In order for this to happen, God disguises himself because Satan won't fight God because he knows he has no chance. So God hides himself in human flesh to go to war to rescue you because that's what you mean to him. And the passion is the place where we see this uh, most especially. So I asked this uh, several times over the last number of months, I know, but just, just look at him for a second. And ask yourself, and then do this with your kids, right? So is Jesus on the cross? Don't ask, answer this out loud. Just hear how stupid this question sounds. Is Jesus on the cross the victim or the aggressor? Is this happening to him, or is he doing something? Looks pretty obviously like he's the, the victim, right? He's not the victim. Who's Jesus? God, right? Where do you get that nail? <laughs> like, really, where do you get that nail? How do you, how do you nail God to a cross? There's, there's no kryptonite, right? The only, there's only one way God can get on a cross. He has to want to be there. Now, why in the world would God want to be on a cross? This little thing is the answer. Jesus on the, on the cross is hunting. <laughs> this, this is uh, something that I felt like the Lord showed me last year in a a brand new way which uh, I've just been encouraged to see is one of the most powerful ways and the most popular way that the early church used to talk about the passion of Jesus. The image, th this thing is uh, what you would technically call an ambush predator. So I, I'm praying in the chapel. We, we had mass last year in the school. It was a Friday morning. It was like the, the Wednesday or the Friday before Holy Week. And I'm sitting there praying not thinking about any of this, and out of nowhere, I just hear the Lord, because I know his voice now, I just hear these two words, ambush predator. I've never heard of an ambush predator in my life. So my phone's with me, I, you know, ask Dr. Google, okay, what's an ambush predator? And I start reading this thing, and I just start to laugh, right? So an ambush predator is, is something that like, looks like that. Huh? It's, it's a, a creature they, they could be in the garden, they could be in your house, they're in your house. They're in the water, they're in the woods back there. They lie motionless and still, camouflaged with their environment, all for one purpose, to attract the prey. And then when the prey gets close, they jump on it. Ugh, right? This is the ambush predator. From the moment of his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus starts to sweat blood, then allows himself to be arrested, chained, slapped, spit on, stripped naked, 
scourged, beaten to a pulp, crowned with thorns, laughed at. This is God we're talking about. Made to carry a cross, nailed to a cross. What's happening? Jesus is more and more and more and more camouflaging his divinity. Also that the enemy will get close. So it's, a, it's not a real encouraged thing to do, but imagine, imagine death just kind of standing in front of Jesus on the cross or Satan standing in front of Jesus on the cross. And I picture that conversation goes something like this. You know, son, you are rather unique. You do extraordinary things, but I've seen miracles before. And you don't sin, but that woman over there at the foot of the cross, she doesn't sin either. And then I picture him looking at his watch, saying something like, but you realize, don't you, in just a few minutes, you're mine. Because no one escapes death. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to happen. He takes from us what he can't, he can't do. What's the one thing God can't do? He can't die. So he takes from us the capacity to die so as to enter into hell, to bind the strong man, to liberate his possessions so that we can go free. <laughs> this is unbelievable stuff, people. This makes Marvel Comics look weak. <laughs> this is what God thinks you're worth doing for. So there's been three kind of classical ways of understanding what Jesus does on the cross. First is, on the cross, He's showing me how much God loves me, which is true by all means. That moves a number of us in here. Others of us, it just doesn't even phase. But it's true, right? God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Second way of understanding the cross is Jesus on the cross is making atonement for our sins. True, right? Pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. That moves fewer of us, quite honestly. Most of us just don't think we're that bad. But it's true. The classic way of understanding what Jesus is doing on the cross is he's going to war. So here's how a couple of the early Christian writers put it. St. Irenaeus says this, Jesus waged war, this is so you don't think this is just my kind of crazy ideas. Irenaeus is writing in the um, late second, beginning of the third century. Jesus waged war against our enemy in crushing him who at the beginning led us away captives in Adam and trampled on his head as you can learn in Genesis, when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He shall, he shall be on the watch for your head, and you shall be for his heel. For from that time, he who would be born of the woman, that is, from the virgin, after the likeness of Adam, was preached as keeping watch for the head of the serpent. Pretty clear, right? You step, step on the head of the serpent, it dies. The serpent bites you, you get a bite. Origen, who's also writing in the third century. For when Christ had bound the strong man and triumphed over him by means of the cross, he even advanced into his house of death in the underworld, and from there he plundered his possessions. That is, he led away the souls which the devil was keeping. This is what he was preaching about in an enigmatic way in the gospel when he said, and then that's that passage we looked at earlier, St. Augustine, last one. This is a great image. The devil was conquered by his own trophy of victory. The devil jumped for joy because, remember, he hates us when he seduced the first man, Adam, and cast him down to death. By seducing the first man, he slew him. But by slaying the last man, Jesus, he lost the first from his snare. And so Augustine continues, the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ came when he rose and ascended into heaven, then was fulfilled. The lion of the tribe of Judah has won the day. The devil jumped for joy when Christ died, but by the very death of Christ, the devil was overcome. He took, as it were, the bait in the mousetrap. That's how Augustine talks about the cross. <laughs> Jesus is the bait. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. <laughs> And the moment that Satan bites, the bar comes crashing down on his head and he's his, his power is destroyed. 
So what's the result of all this? I'll try to wrap this up, and then we can take a quick break, take some questions if we want to. So let me, let me focus on just two passages. They're both in Colossians. Colossians 1. This is what happens in baptism. This is why baptism is so essential. He, God, has delivered us from the dominion or the rule or the authority or the governance of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. In other words, so like the enemy, if, if you're baptized, like the enemy has no control over you. I don't belong to you. I have control over you. Because the one who's in me whooped you. <laughs> so do I sin often? You better believe it. Do you? Absolutely. Why? Because we got habits and we got memories. But I don't have to sin, and neither do you, actually. Which is a really sobering thought. Like, I don't have to sin. Because the power of the risen Jesus is in me and is in you. So your kids are battling fear, anxiety. So you teach them what? You teach them like something as simple as this. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over this spirit of fear or anxiety, and I rebuke you, and I bind you, and I cast you to the foot of the cross, the one who destroyed you. You want to give a young boy a rush? Tell him to pray that. I don't belong to you. You don't have any hold on me. I'm free from you. The other passage is the one that I've been praying with a lot over the last set of months. So Paul says this about what's, what's happened. So God disarmed the, the principalities and powers. So, or more literally, he stripped naked, humiliated, disrobed the principalities and powers. Who are the principalities and powers? Death, sin, Satan, and hell. And has made of them a public spectacle. So he's... A, Another way to translate that would be he's exposed them to contempt, put them to shame, triumphing over them in him or by his cross. So triumph is a very particular word in the Roman Empire. It's only, a triumph is a mega parade in an empire of mega parades. It's held in very rare occasions and for very precise conditions. And it would look something like this. So a triumph, for example, was held by um, Julius Caesar, after he finally defeats the king of Gaul, which lasted for eight years. So Gaul, wherever Gaul is, right? Northern Italy or southern France or wherever. So he defeats this king. They're finally done. Here's Caesar seated on his throne, surrounded by his legion. They captured the king. They bring him up in front of him. One of the legionaries comes over, strips him with a knife, and suddenly the king of Gaul is standing naked in front of the whole Roman legion. And then they force him to his knees. They take an eagle, which is the emblem of Rome. They put it in front of his mouth. They make him kiss it, which is the way of saying, you lost. They stand him up. They tie his hands behind his back. They chain him. They put him in a cage, and they begin to parade back to Rome. This is a triumph. And then into Rome comes Caesar, riding in his chariot, right, surrounded by all his soldiers, all these possessions that he's captured. And at the end of the line is a man in a cage with no clothes on, chained with a sign above his head. And the sign says, this is the one who used to threaten us. He won't threaten us anymore. That's what Jesus has done to Satan. And Satan knows it. Now, why is it still so bleak out if all this has happened? Because, <clears throat> back to D-Day, we live in this gap, if you will, between D-Day and V-E Day. So D-Day is June 6, 1944. From that moment on, the war in Europe's over, and everybody knows it. Hitler knows it. Everybody knows it. But the war doesn't end for 11 months more, right? Then comes victory in Europe, and at least in the European continent, it's over. A lot of death in between. From the moment of the resurrection of Jesus, that's D-Day. Till the Lord comes back, we're living in that gap between those two celebrations. 
and the enemy knows his time is short and he is prowling like crazy looking for someone to devour, most especially parents, because if he can devour parents, he gets their kids. The collateral damage is huge. So we don't want to be naive and think, hey, this is great. It's just going to be a cakewalk from here on, and it's not. But what's important is to realize that the one who's entrusted these young ones into your hands and the one who sent you out on mission, he's the one who just did that to the enemy. And he's the one who's with you at every step of the way. And because he is, I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be nervous. I just have to be on guard. And I want to do everything I can to try to equip my children how to see reality so that they will know when things go wrong and they will go wrong, why they go wrong, and why it is that in the midst of it we still have infinite reasons to have confidence and hope in God and especially what he's done for us in Jesus.